Fantastic. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is uh, the end of week three on social equity. And so I am Denika Scott. And on behalf of the NACB, um, each time we go through um, beginning a meeting, we just take a quick moment to glance at what our milestones are. We have dates of October 1st for reducing or eliminating fees for social equity applicants and by the 15th to have a criteria for social equity applicants for the purpose of obtaining social equity loans and grants from the Cannabis Business Development Fund. And then in November, there'll be additional meetings on um, what is going to happen here in the design of social equity overall with the advisory stakeholders. Can everybody see the um, presentation deck with no issue? Okay, fantastic. Well, I am gonna call this meeting to order and would like to begin with roll call. From the NACB, I have Gina Cranwinkle. Present. Jeffrey Gallego. Present. Megan Howe. Present. And we also have John with us today. Um, he'll be assisting in um, Megan's absence as, as she is upcoming to go out on leave. John. Present. Thank you so much. Then from the subcommittee, um, Ashley Reynolds. Present. I have uh, Nader Hashim. Present. And Julio Thompson um, for the AG's office on behalf of TJ Reynolds. Uh, I'm present on behalf of TJ Donovan, AG for Vermont. Uh, Donovan, I'm so sorry. Ashley, I just gave you a new, I gave him a new last name. My apologies. Um, so, and then um, from the Cannabis Control Board, I, I, I know we have folks in the room. If you'll let me know who's there. Yeah. James Pepper. Yeah, James Pepper. Um, Julie Holbert's joining virtually. Um, and then we have about six or seven members of the public. All right. Fantastic. And I see Nellie is with us as well. Yep. So um, going in now, we have roll call done. I would like to um, go to the latest. Uh, public comment that was received, and this is a summarization of it. Um, but I would like to remind everyone uh, with this recording, if you'd like to make public comments, you can do so on the Cannabis Control Board's website at ccb.vermont.gov, and the exact address is on this slide. But this comment came from Ron Williams, and he asked the committee not to include a requirement of a one year of residency. Um, prior to licensure, and he um, asked that we modify to a simple state requirement residency period. He also asked that the committee um, not only that not only is the Vermont cannabis market equitable, but that it remains attractive um, for young, diverse communities that are underrepresented. And he reiterated that a one-year residency um, could present prevent. Um, them and other young people of color from potentially moving to the state and establishing long and fulfilling lives as Vermont cannabis entrepreneurs. He also noted that he and his team are self-funded with the help of family and friends and they are not accepting any venture capital, which means they had a difficult time finding a location without a, uh, the use of a mortgage, paying for construction, and other steps in the process of establishing a business. Um, beyond that, the state is experiencing a housing crisis. He wanted that noted, and to have to deal with a one-year residency requirement could be a serious barrier at this point to any young company or any young person's journey. Um, in closing, he noted it would be a shame to see us and other people that look like us prevented from being a part of the Vermont cannabis market. He also noted that he has friends who would like to come up and participate, but would like more assurance that there will be a place for them in the market. And um, his hope is that the committee will do the right thing and make this an inclusive market for all. Again, for any members of the public, if you would like to submit public comments, you may do so at ccb.vermont.gov. Um, I yes. just want to add something to this. This was a start, um, summarized version. We will be emailing the full version to everyone on the subcommittee. And in addition to this, he spoke at our last public comments. Um, so he then sent this in writing um, the following day to follow up on the public comments that he made on our Monday's call, just um, so everybody's aware. Great. Thank you. So the next um, order of business is the approval of minutes from Monday, September 20th. 
Uh, can we get a motion to approve? Motion. And a second? I'll second. Thank you. Fantastic. So from there, we're going to go to agenda item number one in the discussion deck, which is defining social equity criteria for Vermont. And I will go to this slide and I will be working in real time to make modifications as we need to, which is why you're not seeing this in presentation format. Gina and Jeffrey, I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you, Danica, for that wonderful introduction. And we are getting to the exciting part. We might be able to vote on this today. Um, one of the things um, we've gone over is who the social equity candidate is. Um, we have determined that if they live in an opportunity zone, they are a member of BIPOC minority. Um, and then if they've been co convicted of a cannabis related offense. One of the changes that I did make onto this is if earlier we had, if it was for a non-violent cannabis offense. Now going through um, legislation, you know, people can, if they have had a violent offense, um, put in to see if they can get that expunged and um, candidates are able to apply for a cannabis license. I'm not sure if they will get a cannabis license that they have um, a violent offense, and we will also speak, be speaking about um, what we believe the expungement record should be. For so, for now, I did take that non-violent component out of this, um, and just saying that if anybody had been arrest, arrested, convicted, or incarcerated for a cannabis offense, a misdemeanor, or a felony, how does everybody feel about that? I'll start with you, Ashley. Your thoughts? I think that looks good. Thank you. Nate? Uh, I agree. I also think it looks good. Thank you. And Julio? I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Okay. And so, um, and this will also relate to anybody who is a member of an impacted family, which we have the definition and have okay that definition. Um, on our last call that was voted in. Now, the interesting part, how do we feel about the residency requirements? Now, we had made a determination last week that we wanted at least one year. On Monday's phone call, we started to discuss two to three um, year requirements. Ashley, um, you have a question? Oh, no, I just wanted to be in line for public <laughs> comment, so no, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so I just want to go over that again. Um, I think we, have, we do not have agreement on this at all, and we have raised a number of questions, comparisons of what's being done in other states, issues about possible interstate commerce issues, um, Ashley, you can make the first comments on this as you've had your hand raised and then would love to then go to Julio about this because I think he has really great expertise in this area. So, Thank Ashley. you so much, Sheena. Thank you. Um, I just want to stress the importance of having some kind of a residency requirement. I would be remiss as a native Vermonter to not feel that we are serving the Vermont people um, that have been affected um, by the war on drugs in a way that it has stand, stood um, prior to legalization. Um, I think that if we do go forward with a residency requirement, um, I don't know if there's any other states, Gina, that you know of where if someone um, still feels as though they are a social, social equity applicant, couldn't go before the board for a public hearing um, to state their case. Um, and perhaps waive that residency requirement for for them. Um, you know, I, I see the public comments. I see, you know, I would like to see diversity. I would like to see young people moving to Vermont. I would like to see there be a fair and equitable cannabis market. Um, I don't see what would prevent um, that particular entity and public comment from applying for a regular license um, and going through the regular way that all other Vermonters on an even playing field would be going through. So um, 
I just want to stress that I'd like to make sure that Vermonters are getting a fair chance in this market and the folks that have been wronged by um, this prohibition, I think we need to make sure that Vermonters are protected. We've already let MSOs in. Um, I know that there is some fear around any sort of residency requirement for any applicant at any level for any licensure uh, in the cannabis market here in Vermont. Um, I don't think that we should be afraid as um, committee members to have a residency requirement and be afraid that we're going to be sued. We've looked at other models at other states that have five of the last 10 years, 15 of the last 20 years, um, way more of a residency requirement than we're even contemplating here with just one year. And I would just like the committee members and um, the board to really look at how we are protecting Vermonters um, with this social equity candidate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley, for those great points that you did make. I have one question. What would um, the amount of years you would prefer um, to have on this? Is that one year? Is that, I know last time you mentioned two to three. I think two to three. Okay. Thank Five you. would be ideal. I know that's what Colorado's doing. Um, I, I, I don't know if there's that slide that you can pull up so that we can reference again. Um, what the other residency requirements are for other states that we've been looking at models for. Awesome. We and it should be right yeah. after it. Um, it should be on top, Danica. Um, right after our our slide or before this slide. Um, and I, what I really want to point out is that this is really for a designated opportunity zone. So. I mean, my preference is that if you were going to have a resident room requirement, it would be for your disproportionately impacted area, which we noted as the opportunity zone. So as Ashley was saying, that in Colorado, they if you live in a designated opportunity zone, you have to have at least lived there for 15 years um, between 1980 and 2010. So as Ashley was saying, you know, having the two year or three year requirement for that one particular thing is quite less. Um, Illinois has five out of the last 10 years. Um, Massachusetts is five out of the last 10 years, and they do specify, um, for, and those are all disproportionately impacted areas, but for a drug conviction, you needed to reside there for the last year. Um, um, and then in Michigan, they um, give points towards if you live um, in a disproportionately impacted area for at least five of the 10 years. So you get a 25% deduction on your application and um, licensing for that. Just so we have, just to go over that again. And I see Lindsay and Susanna um, have arrived. So hi, hi to the both of you. The, um, so thank you again, Ashley, and for pointing out to review that. Um, with that being said, there are cases that are popping up uh, um, to, uh, you know, debate residency requirements. So I'm just going to pass them along to Julio, uh, you know, and um, to give us some information about that and your, and your feelings about this topic. Um, sure. I mean, <clears throat> so the most recent trend in terms of legal challenges um, dealing with residency requirements have all gone against having a residency requirement on the grounds that it's an unconstitutional exercise of protectionism from state residents versus uh, competitors from other states. Um, last month, the state of Maine's um, residency requirement was struck down by a court as a permanent injunction um, as being unconstitutional. Um, uh, there are similar injunctions. I think there was one again in Missouri. Um, and uh, I think last meeting we talked about one that was entered against the city of Detroit. Um, so, you know, looking at the social equity um, landscape for Vermonters, um, the, the criteria here allow any Vermonters who have been act, impacted by the Vermont criminal justice system to compete um, with other Vermonters um, and, uh, and 
the question is, uh, you know, for, for participation in this new market, and the question is whether um, Vermont can, can legally create an artificial barrier that protects them from um, <clears throat> people who reside outside the state of Vermont or haven't been there a year, maybe they've been here days or months, but otherwise meet these four, these, uh, four or five criteria. Um, and so, you know, the picture doesn't look very, very promising for that, uh, notwithstanding what Colorado has done. It's Colorado just hasn't, um, no, no one's challenged Colorado's law, and that could happen and never, or it could happen tomorrow. We don't know. Um, just two years ago, the actually in Colorado, coincidentally, um, there was a case involving a Colorado law which they passed, which required two years of residency for certain wine distributorships. And um, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously, actually, actually the vote was eight to zero, um, said that that was unconstitutional a violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause. Um, so that was a 2019 case. So, I mean, so I, I have concerns about that and the prospects of uh, litigation as it's possible Vermont could be the first one to win, um, but you know the, the the legal current seems to be moving in the opposite direction. So um, I think when it comes to um, application for benefits or loans where the individual applicants are in a position to provide their story, uh, I think making space for Vermonters or people who have been impacted by Vermont's criminal justice uh, system as it relates to cannabis, I think, should have the opportunity to tell that story and have that taken into consideration. But um, I think that just saying people who haven't been here a couple years, uh, notwithstanding their other equities, just simply aren't eligible, even though they might be in Vermont now, I think is probably um, just just erecting too much of a barrier. Thank you. And what is your recommendation for residency or no residency, any residency? I think to be to be identified as a social equity candidate, there shouldn't be a, a residency. Like uh, this, I think what's up here is a one-year residency requirement. Uh, I wouldn't support that. I would support that when social equity candidates are applying for benefits and they're they're you know one of and they're looked at their their applications are looked at in light of you know their the factors that they can identify that makes them eligible for assistance. I think uh, you know people who have been affected by the Vermont criminal justice system. You know, adversely, uh, you know that should be an inquiry that that's afforded, um, in, in, or it should be made in the application process. But it should be a factor, but not like an automatic disqualifier if someone doesn't have that story to tell. Thank you. I think that's a great point, and we can create some, um, you know, example template of someone who would be applying to get, you know, access to education or some other benefits that are received um, to show the committee as well and using that as just something that enhances it as like maybe a merit-based system, um, but some additional points for that. <clears throat> so thank you. Nader, how do you feel about the residency requirements? So I, I have a couple of thoughts floating around. Um, you know, I, I appreciate what both Ashley and Julio have said, um, and you know, I understand the desire to support Vermonters who've been living here for years, um, who have also been affected by the criminal justice system. But on the other hand, I also um, defer to Julio's experience and knowledge uh, when it comes to the. Um, possible legal ramifications of this. And so, you know, wh where I'm coming from, I mean, my original thought was reducing it from five year, from a five-year requirement to a one-year requirement. And then, and, and that stems 
from from my experience in law enforcement when you know in when dealing with these cases drug and addiction cases you know it's it's a the, the population that I dealt with was largely one that um, was transitory and you know not staying in one place for a long time so living in Vermont for six months and then leaving Vermont for six months um, that was largely what the population was um, and so that's why I had my initial concerns about having a residency requirement um, and you know now coupled with the concern about the litigation and the direction that it's going uh, that kind of cre creates a bit more concern regarding having a residency requirement and so I think that Julio um, said something that I strongly agree with which is you know sharing that story and having it be taken into consideration but not creating that blanket residency requirement where it's a yes or a no if that makes sense Yes, and thank you, Nita. That was a good point of, of people um, moving. So just for the record, what is your recommendation? Um, so no residency um, requirement, is, is that your recommendation? I just want to state it for the record. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Susanna, I would love to get your opinion. Yeah, I think, um, sorry, first of all, for joining a bit late, uh, having a different agricultural conversation with different commissions. But I suppose that what I would say is that if we did a residency requirement, I would like to see it be optional. I forget how Julio phrased it, but I appreciate how he said it, right, that it may be a factor, but not necessarily a requirement. Um, but I would also be extremely comfortable with not having a residency requirement at all. Thank you so much. And Lindsay, how how do you feel about this? Sorry, I was having trouble meeting. Um, I honestly, I need more time to reflect on this. As you know, I've been, um, you know, not as dialed into this, and I'm trying to sort of get up to speed and just taking in all of the points. And everybody makes great points, so I really just prefer a little bit more time to, to think this through. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and Ashley, um, after we've gone around and spoken to anybody, is there anything that you would like to add or any additional questions you may have? Um, just that the folks who have been disproportionately impacted in Vermont and chose to stay regardless um, I would like to see them get retribution for staying here. We know it's not easy living here under the best of circumstances, and I continue to stand by wanting to allow Vermonters um, to be at the forefront of this decision. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will call this to a vote um, once we can. Um, once then you could just add the notes here. So if we can go back to slide seven. And so this is how um, the subcommittee social equity will be defining social equity candidate. Um, based on everyone's discussion right now, we will take out that there is a residency requirement um, based on Nader and Julio's suggestions. Um, we will note that um, if someone is applying for any grant or loans or additional access from the social equity funds to make it um, a, a point of adding it to their story and making sure that they get some additional merit for it, but it is not required to get benefits um, from social equity. So. Social equity applicant means an applicant that meets at least one of the following criteria. One, lives in an opportunity zone. We have stated those 25 opportunity zones um, in our previous slide. Um, a member of the BIPOC minority, um, 
three convicted of a cannabis related offense. So they have personally been arrested, convicted, or incarcerated for a cannabis offense, whether that be a misdemeanor or a felony, or are a member of an impacted family system, you know, and we have that definition as well that we have voted on. So Nader, um, how would you like to vote on the definition of a social equity candidate? I vote yes, and I in supporting. Thank you. Ashley. Um, I vote yes, but I think I will ask, um, I think a one-year residency requirement would have um, been a good option. Thank you, Ashley. And we will note that for the minutes on that you would still have like that. Thank you. And Julio, um, how would you like to vote on this? Uh, I would vote yes. Okay, thank you. So three yeses. So this will pass. So yay guys, you met one of uh, the things that were required so far. Breathe, you got one second before we move on to something else. Um, but thank you so much. I think that this will be very helpful. Um, anything that you would like to add or comments before we move on to some uh, um, where we're talking about um, fees and um, some fee waivers for social equity candidates? Okay, let's move on. Let's just go on to that um, the 11 slide for one minute, Danica. So because we no longer have a residency requirement, we do not need proof of res um, Well, I actually, we, we need proof of residency that they're living in Vermont to have this, I would assume. Um, or as establishing a business. And Jeffrey, I'm going to hand that over to you. Proof of residency. Do we still need a proof of residency um, to prove that they they live in Vermont, or is it just that they're going to be operating in Vermont? Actually, I don't know the answer to that question right off that right off the hand. Um, so that's a question. A question for the board is that to have a business in Vermont, um, do they need to be a resident to have a business at all? Um, so I don't know how to answer that question, Gina. Uh, Susanna, you have your hand raised. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, I have a question about this. Is it that the applicant is the person or the applicant is the entity? Because if it's the entity, then are we requiring the entity to be domiciled in Vermont or if it's the person or what if it's co-owned and one person meets the criteria? And I'm sorry if this is basic and I missed it. Um, so that, so it would be an applicant, so it would be a person, but they can have their, they would be establishing a business, so it would need to at least be 51% ownership um, for, in order to establish a business there. Um, but we're not sure, in order to establish a business in Vermont is the question now, what must someone live in Vermont to establish a business in Vermont? So, um, Julio, do you know that, or is anybody in the Vermont Cannabis Control Board? Um, do you have answers to those questions? If not, we will just um, readdress this next on our next call. Uh, for 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 a business entity, I don't know that you need to have a member be a resident of the store. I mean, there are multi-state retailers, for example, that are licensed to do, maybe licensed to do business or have an, an agent who could receive process if they were being sued, but may not have employees who live here. Uh, we have, you know, we have grocery stores and things like that on, on the border, multi-state businesses. Um, but I, I think it might be something we might want to check with uh, the general counsel here for the CCB on that. It's kind of a foundational question. I just don't know. I can't say definitively because I hadn't 
you know, had come up. I don't won't believe that you have to be a, a, I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I do not believe that you need to be a resident of Vermont to start a business here, but I think the Secretary of State's office could help us with that as well. Um, I would like to make a recommendation that if someone, a social ed equity candidate is going to apply for assistance um, in this program that they should be residing in Vermont. I mean, um, Nader, how do you feel about that? I, I agree with that. I think that makes sense. Ashley? I agree with that. Thank you. And Julio? So are you, I mean, there are individual applicants and then there might be, you know, a business that, that, that does business in an adjoining state. And so I don't understand what the proposed residency requirement would be for the business that 50% that its majority shareholders live in Vermont or that it has Vermont employees. Or I'm, that, I'm a little confused by that. That the social equity candidate, I mean, obviously the social equity candidate who wants a licensee, um, would need to be residing in, in Vermont to, to get those benefits. There's no existing residency requirements that need to be had, but if they're getting the benefits that they are currently residents of the state of Vermont. And so there they just have to move to Vermont to get to actively participate, that they can't be living in New York and receive these benefits. Yeah, I think for the social equity benefits, I think that's right. Okay, thank you. Um, so just for the record, Danica, we have three yeses that there is a residency requirement. So this is the proof of residency that we have gone over. Um, I will note that I've added nine, a notarized affidavit from lease holding roommates, um, because there was a question that, you know, if they were just in a roommate situation, and were not on the lease, how we could address that. So we have a Vermont driver's license, identification card, a disability um, identification card. We have a voter registration card, a signed lease agreement, um, or a property deed that includes the applicant's name, a voter registration card, a pay check stub, school district requirements, um, whatever their school district would require to show proof of address, a bank statement, a recent tax return, or a notarized affidavit from the leaseholder just verifying that this person lives with them. Um, and then in addition, for proof of conviction, you would need court documents, uh, probation documents, Department of Corrections documents, um, which all can be requested by the court, which we've spoken to David Shear about already. Is everybody okay with these documents um, requiring them to provide for any social equity candidate? Ashley. I, I see you, uh, your head uh, yeah, Yes, I support that. I support it. Oh, thank you. Uh, Julio? Uh, looking at it, um, uh, I guess I would want to know what counts as a recent tax return. Um, does that mean like a prior year um, or current year? I'm not sure how recent is recent. I would say probably prior year, just in case we're not in, if um, taxes hadn't been filed for that year. Unless you would like to make it a present year, but it's I'm ha what, what is I, I think I think man, I think if if all of the criteria are for the current year, I, I think that's that's fair. Okay, uh, so let's put it for the current year, which could I'm, be last year's tax returns, just because we're on. Yeah. Tax returns are just a year prior. So, so is is that a yes? Yeah. Okay. And Nader? Um, I'll vote yes. Yeah. And just Ashley, if just with that one stipulation of all criteria being for the current year, if you can revote on that. How long 
does it take to get proof of residency in Vermont? Does anybody know? A month? Six weeks? What does it take? I mean, if they show a signed lease, it, it, it's that day, um, I would imagine. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I would imagine in a few days you can show that you have leased an apartment or you're living with someone. And they only need to meet one of these requirements, A through I or all of these requirements, A through I? One of those requirements. Um, can we opt to have them meet at least one or, or more of these requirements? I mean, um, so two requirements, a driver's license plus a bank statement. So two documentation. Or yeah, yeah, two, two okay. of these requirements. Yeah, two of these, okay. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine requirements, yeah. So proof of residency will be two, must admit two of the following documents. Yeah, I like that. And that must be in for the current year. Thank so that you. I'm, real quick, so that I'm clear, government issued ID, Vermont driver's license, that would, I, I'm going to ask is that, or ID, is that the primary and then one additional, or are we asking for a government issued ID and two additional? I need two, I need two of those. This is proof of residency, not necessarily proof of name. Um, but Nita, you have your hand raised? Yes. Um, I, I can't remember if this has been brought up or not, but did we want to add a tenth um, option for a person in which they could provide um, utility bills? as proof of residency because if we're going to be requiring two i just want to make sure that we're giving people as many options as possible um you know like when i had to get my license i needed to in order to prove my residency i had to bring um, some utility bills to prove that i was living where i'm living um so is that something that we could add or was there anything yeah. on that? i think that's a great addition ashley how do you feel about adding utility bill yeah I, I think that's a good addition um nader but and, and again we're talking about the proof of them living here not of where they are conducting business right and that's that and that they're living that in yeah okay that they're living in vermont okay yep i support that okay and nader with this addition do you support the documentation yes Leo? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have for the record that this is the supporting documentation that one must um, submit um, with their application to for the social equity benefit. With now we get to start talking about what those benefits may be. Do we have any comments or questions before we move on? Okay, so uh, we had spoken about this on last week's call, but we weren't able to get it to a vote yet. Um, so we're going to just um, continue to go to the other slides. We spoke about the uh, city of Denver in Colorado. We spoke about Illinois, Massachusetts, Michigan, and then we made our own recommendations here. So the recommendation was the application fee should be waived and that we, everyone seemed to be in agreement with recommendation one, that the first year would be waived. The second year would be 25% of the fee because we do not know what that fee is yet. Um, and different licenses have different fees. The third year would be 50% of the fee. The fourth year would be 75% of the fee. And the fifth year would be full price. We did make a recommendation that someone could apply um, 
to the Social Equity Fund for a waiver for the second year for either a reduced fee um, and or complete elimination of the second year fee if they had a need and could show that need, but also were addressing how they were going to correct it. So if, if someone wrote in the second year that there were issues, building issues or delays or the reasoning why they were not able to afford to pay for their relicensing, um, they would be able to submit this waiver, but they would also need to say how they felt they were going to overcome those challenges and be able to be back on track as a business. Um, so, Danika, if you can just write that there, that second year waiver would be possible. I just want to discuss this again. Um, Julio, were, were you raising your hand? No, I was turning off my camera. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Uh, but let's start. Julio, how do you feel about this uh, recommendation that we had discussed last week? Um, I would favor, uh, of the three, recomm I guess, what's presented on the screen, I, in terms of the fee rate, I'm comfortable with recommendation one. I, had, at the last meeting, suggested the opportunity for a fee waiver um, for, for SE candidates. I, I am also inclined to permit a fee reduction, but not an entire waiver for the third year. Um, that would be, you know, again, you would have to be able to present a cause, but no reduction for years four or five or thereafter. Thank you. Um, Nader, um, how do you feel about Julio's um, suggestion about the third year, that it could be a reduction, but not um, that they would have to pay something if, if there was need. Sorry, my internet. Okay, I think Nader's having some internet issues. I'm going to move on to Ashley. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. Nader, is it working now? Uh, yes, I think so, but I can't make any promises for the next 30 seconds. Um, I support. Julio's recommendation. Um, so I'm a yes vote for that. And Ashley, how do you feel about Julio's recommendation? I like that. And then are there any other states that do profit ceilings for um, year after year after year? I mean, the FE applicant is established. Okay, that's great. Now, you know, let's say they're now outpacing, you know, everyone else, you know, based off of their profits, like, should their fees continue to be waived or significantly reduced? I, I don't know if that's allowed. I mean, I feel like everything's going to be on the table. Everything's going to be transparent for us as a whole of this industry. Um, are there profit caps? Um, no. But would you like to suggest one for for this? This is an open. I mean, I mean, I guess I'm just I'm just want to try to prevent, um, yeah, prevent any sort of abuse of this because I mean, as we know, I mean, the projections for Vermont cannabis industry. Um, I mean, I don't know where people pull these numbers from, but I mean, they're upwards of 250 million, and I feel like you know, there should be some caps here <laughs> um, on people's ability to profit. I think it's a good idea, Ashley, would you like to make a recommendation of what that cap would look like? Let me do a little more digging on other states and maybe you can do the same through NACB and see if, if that is in fact um, being to my, um, adapted anywhere else. But To my knowledge, there isn't um, a cap on it, but I would like to speak to Jeffrey about it. Jeffrey? Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, I can just share with uh, one of the, the conversations that's been happening in the market market structure subcommittee is the potential of uh, production caps, not so much a profit cap, but just like trying to, to control the supply so that, that uh, Vermont does not end up in the same position that Oregon did when their adult use market 
starting you know, like everybody had a green thumb and they ended up with all this surplus and some of it went bad a lot of people lost money and so that was something that came up in market structure um so rather than the limiting the amount of money someone can make they're limiting the amount of product and that's just that's just that's just the discussion that's happening in market structure but i thought that was relevant to what just came up right now yeah, I agree with you, Jeffrey, and I, I do see it as tech, tech, you know, two, two separate issues, but it, hopefully you guys can see where my concern is, is that, you know, the perfect scenario you know, is you have this perfect special equity applicant, they are reducing, we're reducing these barriers, they're thriving, everything's going great, everyone's making money, everyone's serving the community, and then at what point, you know, I feel like five years is a really long time um, as far as the runway is concerned not in the traditional sense of any other business we're given a lot of other freedom for having to show a profit or having to show any growth um but i just i'm curious if this runway of you know either one one to five years um could, could perhaps be shortened or at least you know is there some sort of evaluation that we can do i totally hear you jeffrey on the on the growing capacity side of things and the amount of products that can go into the market i definitely Support canopies on that um, as well, but I don't know if there's any other any other safeguards. You know, I just want to try to prevent any abuse of this program. I I, I definitely agree with you, um, Ashley. I think it's a very valid point that you make. Um, we did five years because we thought that that by that time they should be up and running and in full support. We often know the second year, no one's making money second or third year. Um, even fourth year, you know, cannabis is a very expensive industry. Um, so, you know, we felt that at the fifth year they should be profitable and be able to be self-sustaining. Um, I do see hands up, but we do definitely need to get to the public comments portion of this. And so, let's if we can just wait into uh, after public comments and or this might need to be set aside into Monday's discussion. But I really appreciate the lively discussions we are having on it. So um, Chairperson Pepper, I'm gonna hand this over to you for the public comment portion. And if you could just put the person's name in the chat box, that would be very helpful for us. No, you're gonna be able to do that. Yeah, I can do that. Any uh, public comment in the room? Did, did, no, sorry, right. did someone else raise their hand? <laughs> I didn't see any, yeah. Go ahead, sorry, I thought I saw your hand go up. Maybe you could just state your name for the record. And sure thing. Uh, hi, my name is Ben Mervis. Uh, thank you for the time, everybody, and thank you for your work to the committee, uh, or the subcommittee. Um, my background is actually in public health through the Vermont Department of Health, and then I moved on to the Food and Drug Administration before entering cannabis about five years ago. Uh, I've worked in both California and Massachusetts in markets and industries. Um, now I'm working with Craig Mitchell here on some social equity. We're, we're exploring what a viable business model would look like in Vermont um, as a social equity applicant. Fortunately, with your approved um, with, with your vote to approve the qualifications, we now can move forward confidently with him knowing that he'll qualify as a social equity applicant. Um, and if anybody wants to catch up or missed it, he did submit a public comment on August 29th just kind of stating his intentions as an advocate uh, and an entrepreneur in the industry. Um, we There's a little bit of confusion on my end when it comes to the application fees. If we're talking about applications for a specific social equity uh, license or if it's any social, or if it would be a social equity applicant applying for all licenses. Um, but with that in mind, we do have a few immediate suggestions or requests for the subcommittee to consider moving forward. And I understand this would be after you get through the first two reports that are due at the beginning of October. Um, but our first is to develop social equity policies that would reduce barriers for applicants pursuing any of the general license types um, as opposed to a specific social equity license. We've seen this in other states and it can include something as simple as removing the 
a requirement for a permanent address when you're applying for, say, a provisional license and then uh, allowing that permanent address to come into effect when you apply for your final license. Um, our second suggestion is considering granting social equity applicants exclusivity on social consumption and delivery because both of those functions are so innately tied to the community, to the destigmatization of cannabis within BIPOC communities and marginalized communities as a whole. You're talking about um, consumption, which is incredibly personal, and then also inviting someone to your home. Um, we also think it would be a great way to uh, further healthy consumption habits within those communities. Um, and then lastly, we're really aligned with everything we've heard from the CCB meeting so far with creating a unique industry here in Vermont. And as such, one of the things we think would make this the strongest social equity program in the country so far would be to create an integrated license for social equity applicants to kind of build their own um, their own application, their own license type. They would be able to choose from a combination of cultivation, product manufacturing, wholesale, retail, delivery, and social consumption. Um, so essentially giving social equity applicants the ability to build their own business at whatever scale, um, but with unlimited opportunity, because we think that is what will set the state up for great success. So thank you very much. Thank you. And just to clarify, when we were talking about application fee, it would be for any um, application, any license that they were choosing. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, it's Mark with the Racial Justice Alliance and the Cannabis Equity Coalition. Uh, and good afternoon. Our special shout out to Gina, as usual. Um, thank you for the work, yeah. your work. Um, I think we are at conclusion of the notes that we'll be providing, the coalition, the notes that we'll be providing to this process, uh, to the CCB as well as uh, to, the, um, to this committee and other committees. Um, I believe those will go out tomorrow, will come out to you tomorrow and we'll set up uh, some, um, you know, some kind of collab coordination on um, further discussions. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, just the um, there is a um, discussion on minimum amount of uh, time that one would have to reside in um, the state to be considered a resident, and I saw that was really thoroughly debated. And I, I understand, uh, Julio, the, um, the concern about um, the legal ramifications and in, in the concern of erring on the side of caution. Uh, and I think the uh, propensity, I should say, to err on the side of caution um, in terms of that being a requirement, but personally feel uh, that um, if, um, if, the, if, if that is the only reason, it's, it's just because there's just a, um, a, a propensity to want to err on the side of caution with all other uh, aspects of aspects of the argument being logical uh, to um, certainly uh, take that move, make that move. Um, I, I think in, in cases like that, the, that we should have the courage to do the right thing as opposed to erring on the side of caution. So I just wanted to um, just bring that out, out as a point that I caught in the conversation just now. Um, the question is: is um, is it the right thing to do? Is is to um, uh, as Ashley had pointed out uh, very clearly is to you know give it some time uh, for uh, um, as far as making sure that folks are required to, to be in place for a while um, before these um, benefits are available. So um, I'd, I'd, I'd strongly ask the, the, the CCB to uh, consider um, you know what it, I mean I think even the IRS requires you to be in place for 183 days before they consider you to be a resident here. Um, so I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just leave that there. Um, there is um, still a conversation about, um, it, you know, the, you have reached a, a decision about um, equity applicants that involves opportunity zones. That's, um, it, it seems to kind of forego the conversation that we were having about um, um, 
creating um, creating programming uh, that comes out of this um, this um, taxation and regulation emerging market that would be di directing resources to, into communities as opposed to at individuals. And I just I said it last week when I was here, and I'll, I'll say it again. You know, CH four fourteen, the um, the program that we put forward that would seek to reinvest in some of these communities uh, to lift these communities up that have been impacted by uh, this so-called war on drugs. Um, and I think that opportunity lexicon was really derived from the uh, research that we did in that work largely like Illinois. Um, and I just don't know how appropriate it is uh, respecting and understanding that you've already voted. I don't, under, I don't know that an opportunity zone for a social equity applicant is um, the right approach. Um, so I, I don't mind being in the minority on that, but I just wanted to bring that out. I think opportunity zones certainly are relevant, but I think they should be more relevant as in a conversation when we are directing, you know, a percentage of excise taxes towards a community for community revitalization, these communities that have been harmed uh, by impact. So I hope we get to that conversation at some point. Um, I want to lift up uh, the, um, and we'll lift up further and moving forward the, the whole um, conversation on licenses like delivery licenses, uh, like uh, ideas like co-ops uh, and also uh, uh, ideas like uh, um, equity applicant uh, integrated licensing. Uh, we certainly uh, support all of those and you'll hear more from us uh, on those ideas. I think they're uh, uh, great ideas. Um, thanking the, uh, the, um, this subcommittee for your work as usual. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. And just so far for both public comments, um, we will be getting to other topics that you raised. Um, as soon as possible. Are there any other public comments in the room? Uh, that's it, Gina. Thank you. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Thank you, Ashley. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Nader. Well, this has been a great call. Thank you, everyone, and I appreciate your time, your advice, your wisdom, and I will see you on Monday.